One thing I've learned since the start of this channel is there's a lot of misunderstanding about what it actually costs to own and operate a motor vehicle. We're gonna dive into that today, and I'm also gonna share some data that I think really helps shed some light on the costs of car dependency. It's all coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggested topics, always welcome. And today's topic is sort of a viewer suggestion, albeit indirectly. You see, from time to time, I do these race videos where I compare the travel time and cost for different modes. And without fail, I get tons of comments from people telling me I'm overestimating the costs of driving. Like, the following are just from my Texas High Speed Rail video alone. Your statement about depreciation, insurance, etc. is a fallacious attempt to gerrymander the results. The only relevant cost here is gasoline. You way overestimated the driving cost. I have a basic car that gets me 32 miles per gallon. That trip would only cost me $20, not the $158, double question mark. I think you've overestimated the cost of gas. I have a Honda Fit, and I spend $25 in gas. And that's just a small sampling. It's kind of funny, but it also really goes to the heart of why car dependency is so entrenched in the US. This really is the way most people understand the cost of driving a car. Having a car itself is non-negotiable. It's a given. So when you're making a decision about whether to drive somewhere, the only cost you really need to factor in is gas. So in a way, today's video is a peek into the psychology of car culture and how the costs people consider when they drive every day are completely misaligned with the costs they're actually paying. So what this video isn't going to be about is externalities, meaning the non-monetary costs that driving imposes on everyone else. An example is this graphic that's been circulating recently that illustrates a lot of the environmental costs of driving, but there are also things like congestion and delay drivers impose on everyone else, bad land use patterns, and increased death, injury, and just general mayhem in the public right of way. All interesting topics for a different video, but today I just want to talk about what people pay out of pocket for the privilege of transporting themselves around the city in a climate-controlled glass and metal box that weighs 20 times as much as they do. If I'm on your feed on the Bird app, then you've seen this take, but the lead here is that the fact that the only cost people seem to account for is gas when they're choosing how to get around every day is not only a huge problem, but it's a very intentional part of the automotive industry's business model. So first, let's lay out all of the personal costs associated with driving and see how expensive it really is. First, the big one, capital cost. When you buy a motor vehicle, you're purchasing an asset that goes on your personal balance sheet. It's a depreciating asset, but it's still an asset. And there are all kinds of ways people pay for cars. You can pay all cash up front, or you can do what most Americans do and take out a loan. I'm not really gonna spend time talking about financing and interest. It's gonna vary based on your credit score and some other factors, but here are some numbers that are kind of eye-opening. The most recent data shows that Americans borrow an average of about $40,000 for a new car and 27,000 for a used car. And that's just the borrowing piece, let alone if you're putting down a down payment or doing a trade-in. Anyway, the number the dealer always wants you to focus on is just the monthly payment. And that's in the data too, it's not pretty. And the average loan term, whether it's new or used, is almost six years. And that's how most people think of the capital cost. It's a monthly payment with occasional periods of bliss where the car is paid off and it feels like it's essentially free. So quick disclosure, before I got into planning and engineering, I was actually in accounting. So it really colors the way I think about this and it's probably why I have a stronger opinion on it than a sane person should. Anyway, here's how I view the capital cost of a motor vehicle, regardless of how you pay for it. You buy it, it depreciates, and then you sell it for a much lower price. The differential over whatever time period you own the car is what the car costs. Edmunds has a good infographic on this. They show on average a car loses 11% of its value 
when it's driven off the lot because now it's not a new car anymore. And then it loses 15 to 25% of its residual value every year thereafter. After five years, it's worth something like 35 or 40% of what you paid for it. So just think about that. If you buy a new vehicle for $40,000 and you wanna trade it in after five years, it's gonna be worth about $15,000. Rinse and repeat, you're paying $25,000 or $5,000 a year just for the capital cost of owning a car, not including interest or any of the other expenses like gas, insurance, and maintenance. Now let's go through the other expenses. Insurance, which is gonna vary based on things like your age and your driving record and the year, make, and model of your car. Might average around $1,800 a year. Then there's general maintenance. You're gonna be getting oil changes and then rotating your tires once or twice a year getting car washes so maybe 250 bucks a year and then you're gonna want to buy a new set of tires every five or six years so add like 150 bucks a year for that vehicle registration and emissions testing which is gonna vary by state could be something like 100 bucks a year and then there's parking which is completely variable and just depends a lot on where you live where you work and where you like to go it can be quote unquote free if you park on the street Street, but your car might get broken into occasionally, so you might pay more for a place with a garage. But let's be honest, the only time most people pay out of pocket for parking is if they're driving to like an airport or a sporting event. It's free almost everywhere else outside of downtown. Well, other than it's baked into the prices you pay at the stores and restaurants that have all that free parking, even if you don't drive there. The fact is, you're subsidizing free parking even if you choose not to drive. Just think about the opportunity cost of all the public right-of-way, land that we all collectively own, theoretically, that's devoted to on-street parking. It's just wildly counterproductive. And that brings us to gas, which is the only cost that people tend to notice in their day-to-day -day lives which, no coincidence, is why people are losing their minds over it now. And it's completely variable. It depends on your fuel efficiency. It depends how much you drive. It depends on the price of fuel. Or if you have an EV, your capital cost is probably higher, but you're paying less on energy and maintenance. So I've got an interesting national data set to share and kind of a punchline to all of this, albeit kind of an unfunny one. But first, feel free to drop a like on the video if you enjoy tedious explanations of proper accounting. Subscribe if you're a glutton for punishment, and let's check the numbers. We can now fill city ground, home of Nottingham Forest Football Club, currently in the second division of English football, but a club that won back-to-back -back European Cups, that's today's Champions League, in 1979 and 1980. But honestly, I picked City Ground this week just because I love that it's like 750 feet away from Meadow Lane where Notts County plays. Eh, only in the UK. Okay, here's the kicker on this whole thing. Even though gas is the only apparent marginal cost, the only cost that feels like it scales by how much driving you do, it's really an illusion. The reality is all the costs I mentioned, the capital cost, insurance, maintenance, all of them scale by how much driving you do. If you drive more, the odometer on your car turns over faster, it accelerates your maintenance schedule, and it moves up your timeline for vehicle replacement. If you drive more, that means more exposure and higher potential for crashes and citations, both of which will increase your insurance payment. It all scales. So my guy who thinks driving from Dallas to Houston is only gonna run him 20 bucks, well, you don't need to be a CPA to see that that just does not compute. So as promised, let's go to the national data. This is information from the 2019-2020 Consumer Expenditure Survey, which is regularly published by the US Bureau of Labor and Statistics. It's an interesting data set, and I'll leave a link in the description. You've maybe heard that the average US household spends and 15% of their budget on transportation and 30% on housing, which is true in the aggregate, but sometimes you hear it presented as sort of a budgeting guideline, which I think is ridiculous. There is a ton of variation in what different households spend. Luckily, you can slice up the BLS data in different ways, including by household income. And if you look at household spending on transportation and housing by percentage of income instead of overall expenses, it's a more nuanced 
nuanced story. If you look at income quintiles, meaning if you split up all US households into top 20% income, second 20, middle 20, et cetera, you really start to see what a drag housing and transportation spending is on household finances. If you're in the middle quintile of households, yeah, you're around 30% on housing and 15 on transportation. But most households, in fact, exactly 80% of them, are not in the middle quintile. If you're in the lowest quintile, you're spending 31% of your income on transportation and 80% on housing. Yeah, your math is correct. That is over 100%. And that's really Really the definition of not being able to get ahead. If you're in the next quintile up, it's 18% on transportation and 42% on housing, and you're still falling behind. The highest two quintiles spend more on transportation and housing, but it's proportionately less of their income. It's not really a surprise, but I don't know, it's interesting to see it in the actual data. Let's dig a little further into that middle quintile because the BLS data really details out the types of spending on transportation. It's about $3,900 on vehicle capital costs. So that's an average for all households in this quintile. It includes new vehicles, used vehicles, all cash purchases, loan payments. It's really including all the phases of vehicle ownership we talked about earlier, all smashed together. Spending on fuel averages $1,800, insurance $1,600, about $1,700 on all other vehicle related costs. And the average spending on public transportation was $392. Keep in mind, some of these are gonna be multi-vehicle households. Eh, some are zero vehicle households. So these aren't per vehicle numbers. But the point is, you could really see the impact of that transportation expense line and what it could mean if someone has the ability to get by without a car. It's not one size fits all, and I'll talk more about car-free living in challenging environments in a future video. I'm not gonna tell you it's super feasible for every single household. In fact, I'm 100% sure I'd get called elitist for even suggesting that. But my hope is that the data I shared today sort of crystallizes what the actual cost of driving is and illustrates why breaking the cycle of car dependency is so important for helping people build financial stability and a better quality of life. That's all I've got. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new installment next week and I'll see you then.